Uh, excuse me. Okay, um, so how's everybody doing? Can everybody hear me? My voice is feeling pretty bad today. I don't know. Okay, thanks. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to last too long. Um, so as usual, you know, um, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and um, start. Um, let me know if you want to talk about anything. Um, <clears throat> I mean, definitely, I'm, I'm supposing I, <laughs> uh, I suppose that um, people are probably, hopefully working on the next assignment here. So um, I'm, I'll probably go over that um, um, a couple times, see if there's questions on those. And of course, we could talk about our materials for this week. Um, so really, the, the, the assignment that you guys are working on right now um, is, um, you, it, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, a lot of it is about the polynomial regression and also using regularization. So, so yeah, I don't know if this applies to any of you all that are uh, here. Uh, right now or not, but uh, hopefully you kind of were working ahead a little bit and have already uh, kind of been looking at that material and have started on the assignment. If not, you know, you, you definitely want to get the, um, uh, get your, um, look through the lecture material and, and the notebooks as soon as possible and get started on the assignment. Make sure you leave yourself enough time to work on it. Although I don't know, we'll, we'll see. I, I don't know if this assignment will it will take any longer than the, the previous one, um, maybe, but. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, do anybody kind of want to take an opportunity before I start talking about some stuff to ask about the assignment or anything? Okay. Um, let's see here. I mean, I think I brought this up um, uh, last uh, our last help session and talked about it a bit. But um, but yeah, maybe until you go through the, the all the things on linear regression and especially polynomial regression and learning curves and stuff, um, um, it might not uh, be too easy to get started on. So. But um, yeah, real quickly, there was, um, um, you have to start by loading the, the, the artificial data set that I gave you guys on this. Um, uh, I think, as I said, somewhere in here, uh, it's, it's a data set. Um, so what was it, assignment three data. So if we go back here and look in our data directory, you should see it. it's relatively simple. There's just, <clears throat> um, I just, gave 100 items and, and there's only a single feature um, and then the other column is the actual the, the label right so but this is an artificially generated data set <coughs> excuse me uh, but the thing about this though is that i used uh, a nonlinear function so um i think for plotting um i mean you probably don't have to specify a limit or for your initial plot if you just uh plot it, it'll, the, the default. I mean, the, the, the data shouldn't range, the X ranges from like negative one to one, I think. Um, and then, you know, the Y probably has a maximum, it's, it's no, no value is negative. So the values go from zero to nine or zero to 10 at most. So, but yeah, for this data set, when you load it and plot it, uh, if you don't specify a limit, it should show it to you just fine, I think, if you do just a regular scatter plot. So. But um, yeah, the secret for this, this mystery data set that I gave you for assignment three is that um, uh, I used a non-polynomial um, function. So there's a non, sorry, a non, not, not, there's a non-linear, there's a non-linear relationship between the single feature that you have and the output value. So, so it's, it's not linear. So you can't use a linear, a straight linear fit to get a good model of this data. Um, and as, as I think I said, um, I guarantee it's no less than like a degree three. So it's at least a cubic function, uh, but it's no more than like a degree 20 polynomial for the 
relationship between the the X feature and then the Y outputs. So. So um, and we can come back to the assignment uh, if people have questions, but uh, the, the general thing, I mean, I walk you through the steps you should do. So you should start by trying to create a degree 20 model. So a model that you're hopefully is going to be, is going to be badly overfitting the data that you have. Um, <clears throat> so, so overfit it um, and do cross validation um, with your overfit model in order to get a feel. So uh, if you've looked through the materials for this week, and I, I'll go through these a little bit. So, um, um, so did it say my, uh, yeah, so maybe I'm wrong about that. So I don't think you really need to clean anything. Um, So uh, if, uh, for people that maybe watch this video later, not interactively, somebody was asking about um, uh, a medicine, something in here that you might have to do a little bit of data cleaning. Um, yeah, if I said that, which I'm sure I did probably here somewhere, um, uh, that's probably not really correct. So I, I think you'd be able to just load it and use it. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, your input feature is already kind of normalized. So the um, the x values are just in the range from negative one to one. So um, <clears throat> oh um, yeah. So I, uh, pr probably also the thing, the only thing you need to do in terms of data cleaning is, uh, you know, if you load it using pandas uh, CSV, you just need to split out the, the X column to become your, your X inputs and split out the Y column to be your label. So I think that's all I really meant for that. Uh, that's the only cleaning you need. You don't really even have to normalize the data or anything like that. So. Okay, so yeah, the, the only thing you really have to do is just split that into two separate NumPy arrays so that you can use um, scikit-learn um, machine learning uh, objects to, to do a fit and a, and a predict and, and all the normal stuff that we've been doing. So. <clears throat> um, So anyway, yeah, back to this. Um, so if, if you overfit a model and then you do some cross validation, this will give you, um, well, this doesn't give you a lot of information, although, you know, if you, if you plot the learning curves, um, oh, and yeah, by the way, you know, so I just gave you this function. So, you know, you should, I mean, you're, you're free to do it a different way if you want to, but um, if you do it the, the way that we showed in the lecture notebooks, uh, for this week, you should be able to just directly use this function again from our lecture notebooks and give it a um, scikit-learn model and give it the X and Y and it will plot the learning curves for you. Um, uh, we're using this function here. So. But yeah, I mean, you know, if you overfit correctly, you should see evidence of overfitting if you do, if you plot the learning curves. And then um, I kind of, yeah, I, I ask you to, um, oh, just a second, let me go back here, look at something. Um, yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, but, but yeah, after you get an overfit model, um, you know, go back and um, then start doing some regularization, which we can talk about here if people <coughs> have some questions about regularization and what it does. So, so from your overfit model, this should um, um, allow you to get a better idea of um, what the true um, nonlinear relationship is of the data here for the assignment. <clears throat> In particular, you know, as we talked about in our lecture videos for this week, uh, the, the, the lasso regression um, 
could be very useful here because um, um, you know the 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 data the 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 model is, is probably the uh, sorry the, the actual relationship of the data is somewhere less than a degree twenty polynomial. So this um, uh, you know especially the lasso re regularization can can uh, help you uh, get a better handle on which um, d d degree you know w w which degrees of the polynomial aren't really needed uh, for a good model here. So. So anyway, uh, um, yeah, like I said, and we can come back to this, um, but uh, yeah, after you do some regularization, then I open it up a little bit more. So uh, this should allow you to um, estimate maybe um, kind of what the, um, what the true nature is of the polynomial that was used to generate the data. So from that, you ought to take your best guess and then try and fit a model uh, using that polynomial degree. So using a, a polynomial fit of, of that degree uh, from your explorations here and like the part three, four, and five, right? If you do that, and you might want to apply a little bit of, um, of um, you know, try, try applying a little bit of, um, of, of ridge regularization, um, even though you've reduced your degree, you know, again, um, so as I discuss a little bit in here, you won't be able to, you, you, you definitely won't be able to uh, completely recover the, all the parameters for all of the polynomial terms here, but you, you even won't be able to be able to be completely certain what the true degree of the polynomial function is here for this assignment, right? So um, as you'll see, so I mean, later, a, a, after we um, turn this, in this assignment, um, I'll, I'll let you guys know what the true polynomial was and what the true parameters were for each of the polynomial terms. And you'll be able to see kind of how close you got um, when you fit your model, when you take your best guess and then you fit your model to how close you got on this regression task here. So, so that, that's kind of, you know, um, what you're trying to do here. Um, th this, this kind of practice like this is, is, is in my opinion, it's really good uh, practice. So, you know, w when you practice on data like this, when there, there's, there's, there's a true relationship out there to discover. Um, and, and at this point, I know what the true relationship is of the, this data, what the true nonlinear relationship is, but you don't, right? So uh, later, you know, after you, um, have tried your best to figure it out just from the data, um, you'll be able to go back and then see, you know, um, um, kind of what things were, uh, you know, when, once you know the true relationship, you know, what, what things were, were actually true in your thinking and what things were false, you know. So, so, so working with made up data like this or working with simulated models like this can be very helpful in, in honing your intuition about building machine learning models, you know, so. or doing competition. So um, if you guys, so hopefully you guys um, will learn about, if you haven't already, about Kaggle um, or other similar sorts of competitions. Those are good things to do as well, um, um, like maybe um, after you're done with this class, if you wanna get more practice, seek out things like that that you can hone your skills on. So. <coughs> okay. Um, All right, so yeah, maybe I'll start talking a little bit about um, our, our, our lecture materials for this week. Um, so, um, so a question was asked about, is machine learning all about plots? Um, I wouldn't say that, although I, I would say um, being able to visualize your data, whether both before you're doing stuff, so data visualization when you're doing exploration beforehand, um, and data visualization after you have a model in order to um, 
present results are both very important kind of skills. So, 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 so maybe not necessarily about machine learning, but about data analytics or being a data scientist in general, you know, visual, visualization um, and learning how to, to, to do that well, uh, it helps in a lot of, a lot of points of, of doing a, um, a data analytics task. So, so yeah, it's definitely a useful skill. Uh, let's see. So yeah, this this week. Um, so I don't know. I mean, uh, feel free also if, if you had stuff about the the last week's um, um, materials as well. So like I said, you know, th this this stuff is really important that we did last week. It's kind of the heart of um, uh, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be doing. Um, uh, where we look at other machine learning mechanisms, uh, it, it, it uses the same ideas, okay? So at their heart, um, so the stuff that we talked about and that you should have been looking at last week, um, about having a model, like, like a regression model, which is really just a set of parameters, and then using some sort of a cost function in order to fit it, uh, and then using an optimization, like gradient descent, uh, in order to find the, the optimal set of parameters, however you're defining your model, you know, that this is all, uh, th those concepts are, are reused over and over uh, in many machine learning techniques that we look at. So support vector machines and, and trees um, and um, uh, kernel methods and other stuff all uh, kind of can fit into this idea is when we're talking about um, supervised learning like this. And, and, and also when we're doing, um, supervised learning on um, classification problems instead of regression problems. So next week, uh, we'll extend kind of this idea of cost functions and stuff to look at the logistic regression that we've already introduced in this class, uh, but, uh, but the changes you have to make for your cost function and, and thinking. But, but still, it comes down to you can, you can define a slightly different version of your cost function and then just use the, the same sort of gradient descent or some sort of an optimization method to um, do a classification task. So, so make a model that, that does a classification like we did for a regression task in our previous week. So, um, so uh, once again about the um, Minimal data, just real quickly on assignment three. Um, so somebody pointed out, I, I said something about um, you might have to do some data cleaning or preparation. Um, you probably don't really have to do anything except if you read in using pandas, um, you'll have a data frame that has both the X um, inputs and the Y outputs. So you'll probably, the, the only d real data cleaning you have to do is just split off your inputs into one NumPy array and your outputs into another um, NumPy array in order to use with scikit-learn. So that, that's probably really the only thing you need to do. All right. Uh, okay. Let's see here. Um, all right, so yeah, like as usual, um, I thought I might go through these, um, our, our kind of materials for this week, see if that prompts any questions, um, if people want to talk about anything. Um, so I mean, this, Last week, this week, and next week, we're still all, all from chapter four of our um, hands-on machine learning textbook here. So these were the, the sections about um, um, polynomial regression um, and then regularization. So. Oh yeah, we did, we did kind of two topics on this first one. So polynomial regression and um, learning curves here. So. Um, all right, so yeah, if, if you haven't, as, as I kind of already said, if you haven't really um, 
gone through these materials yet, you, you should probably try to do this as quickly as possible because th these are directly kind of what you're doing for this assignment three here, right? So this is an example of a made up data set like you're doing on assignment three, but here in, in this case, um, it's a quadratic, right? So, so we've got a, um, um, a power two polynomial function with three parameters. So one half times the x squared parameter plus three fourths times the x to the power of one plus three times x to the power of zero. Um, so that's our polynomial function. So that's, you know, that, that's, that's just a parabola. So a quadratic gives a, a parabola. Um, but if we add some noise, um, I mean, this becomes, so, so if this was the true relationship, um, so, and, and, and lots of systems can cause things like this, like, like a, to have a nonlinear, but a relatively simple polynomial relationship between some generating function of the system and the outputs that you'll see when you measure, when you try and measure the system, right? So in that case, you'll get a nonlinear relationship, but, um, and then it could be more complex, right? So for your assignment three, um, it, it's going to be higher than, than X squared. Um, so um, uh, X cubed or higher function that's gener that's, that's, generating or, or governing the system that you're trying to model with your data here. So, so here notes, I mean, because we add in some noise, um, so here's where we're adding in the noise, right? So hopefully everybody understands this, you know, we're using vectorized calculations here. Um, um, to do our polynomial function. We just generate some random values. And again, this is all exactly the same as what you have for assignment three. So we're generating um, 100 random values here. Uh, although in this case, they, they range from negative three to three instead of from negative one to one, like in your assignment. Um, and this just kind of fits the polynomial. So if we didn't add this noise, right? you would see that um, all of the data points are exactly on the, the polynomial curve. And, and it wouldn't, um, this wouldn't be a very tough test because you can easily find a cost function like this if there's no real noise that's hiding the relationship in your data, right? But real, real data is never gonna be like this. There's gonna be, there's gonna be errors in the measurements um, there's going to be errors introduced just from the tools that you're using for the measures, uh, measurements, you know, so they'll not be able to measure with exact precision. Um, the, um, uh, there might be more than um, things that, that are uh, causing values to be added to your output and so on, right? So anyway, the, the point is, is that um, you know, you'll always have some noise. Here we're simulating some noise in this the system by by using a normal uh, uh, sort a Gaussian or a normal uh, noise source. So so we create a hundred bits of information that have a a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, um, and then we multiply by 0.5. So that just changes it. So their their standard deviation is 0.5 instead of one. Um, the result, though, will be that that all of our data points will be won't be on the uh, the true function. They'll be a little bit above or below. Um, so uh, the, the the true function that was actually generating the the, the data here. Right? So yeah, I mean, you know, clearly, if you looked at this. Um, a, a straight line fit or, or to a, a, um, an experienced data scientist, this definitely doesn't look very linear. I mean, especially because it looks like our slope is negative for a bit here and that's positive and becoming even more and more positive maybe um, over here. If I just took away the red line and I could, and I, so again, you know, if, if for what you're doing for the assignment, you don't know what the true function is. So you don't have the, the uh, the true function here, right? You've only got the data, but but just looking at the data, um, it doesn't really look linear, right? Um,
so, um, oh yeah, so by the way, um, Polyfit um, from the NumPy library um, that I show an example of here um, can actually do a polynomial fit. That's, I mean, as its name implies. So um, as we showed it before for doing linear fits, we did it with a degree one polynomial. That, so that fits a line to the data. So um, if you fit a line to the data, oops. Um, should be able to do that. Um, uh, oh, um, yeah, I'm getting an error because, of course, if you fit a, a line to the data, you only get two fitted parameters. So, so if we fit a line, we're expecting only x1 and x2 or a, b for our two fitted parameters here. So, oops. So um, in that case, what did I do there? Um, oh, <laughs> but I'm still fitting. I'm still fitting with A, B, and C here. So um, all right. Uh, but I mean, you know, I, I'm I spent a little bit of time on this because it, again, this this does. Bring home the point about um, you know going back to our last week's material. So so you can just think of these as parameters of of you know um, so what we call theta zero well, say theta zero for the the intercept parameter and then theta one theta two um, and then you have more of these if you have higher degree polynomials. And so that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, although here you know um, we call it a b because uh, those are often called a b c d in other areas of mathematics when we have a a, a, a polynomial like this. Um, but yeah, so, so you can fit a line to it, but that's not going to be a very good model um, for this data here, right? Um, and we could fit, we could try and fit like a, like a, um, overfit the model, like a, a degree five polynomial, right? So for degree five polynomial, there's actually six data parameters, right? Because it goes down to, to the, the intercept parameter. So, so here we've got the A, B, C, D, E, and F, I meant. So, and um, I'm getting, so now you can kind of see, uh, at this point, um, I might want to um, use some linear algebra instead of naming all these parameters separately so I don't have to, keep uh, redoing all this, but uh, so yeah, if I wanted to display that fit, um, I'd have to go ahead and expand this out to be, um, so it should be AXH to the fifth power plus uh, B times XH fourth. So you know the the uh, the e parameters, the x rays of the one are just x. And then the, the intercept parameter is just the x rays of the zero are just one, right? So. so in this case, the model is not going to look too bad, um, um, even though we're kind of overfitting. So, um, but um, eh. so, so like we show later on here, if, if you go to a really big polynomial though, you, you'll start definitely seeing some, some examples of overfitting here. So um, anyway, so that, that's kind of what polyfit here, but that's kind of a good illustration of the general thing that we're doing here. So let's go back to the, the squared um, or the, the degree two polynomial here. So notice when my, my fit here, so remember that the true parameters are one half, three fourths, and three. So that's what I talk about in your assignment three, that, that there's, there's, tr there, there's, there's not only a true number of um, a degree of the polynomial, but for each one of those parameters, there's, there's a, a true um, 
um, value that I use for the for the fit for, for the, the the theta parameters or however you want to think of these. So in this case, it's one half, three fourths, and three. So so notice um, again, since we added noise, you won't be able to completely recover it, but we should get pretty close, right? Because it's, it's not too noisy. So one half, 0 0.5, and then three fourths, 0.75, and then three here. No, so it's not too bad off. Um, so this, I mean, this is kind of, this is not necessarily um, machine learning. I mean, this is, this is, we're kind of doing some stuff in statistics and um, uh, what's it's called, like uh, experimental methods sorts of stuff here. If you take a, a class experimental method, you know, so, you know, if, if the noise is not so big, um, when you fit models here, uh, you'll be able to get closer, for, so 0.495 and 0.75, right? Um, when your noise is not too, oops, when your noise is not too bad. All right, you'll get real good fit, right? But, uh, so you normally, and I mean, that's kind of the importance of good data and being able to measure good and be able to get lots of data. So another thing is that, um, um, uh, again, this is kind of from experimental methods or basic statistics is, uh, even if you have lots of, so if, if you have lots of noise, um, so let's make the noise like 2.0. So that, that makes the, the tough a lot the, the task a lot tougher to fit. So now it's here. Now it's not maybe so clear that it's a nonlinear relationship, although it looks a little suspect with all this uh, kind of more variation over here than over here, right? And if you do a fit, you'll see that the parameters are kind of, I mean, they're still not too bad, but they're further away. Right. And, you know, it doesn't look too bad, right? But, um, but we can make the task even noisier and, 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 and make it really tough to begin to extract the stuff here. So notice how far away from a, a half and three-fourths that we're getting now. Right. But, and again, this shows kind of the, the why it's, it's very useful to play around with simulations like this, right? So you can't do this with real data. If you have a real data set, I mean, there might be uh, something that's really governing the function, the, 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 the relationship between the, the, the features that you're measuring and the, the label that you're trying to predict, right? But you'll never be able to know what the true function is. You know, there, there's going to be multiple sources of noise, right? In, in this day of big data, the, the, the very easy thing you can do is, even if you have lots of noise, if you can gather lots of data points, that will make it uh, easier to find a good um, model of your data, right? So that might be a little bit too big. Let's see if that uh, runs there. So, but if we, if we plot, get lots of data points, uh, even though there's lots of noise here, um, um, I mean, you'll still be able to get relatively very good kind of fits to the um, uh, between your model and the data. So that, that's kind of one of the reasons why big data is, um, you know, it's kind of for free. You know, so in 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 the world of statistics, before we had computers and big data, you couldn't capture big data sets, so you had to use statistical methods to try and determine what the bounds or, or, or how accurate your models, your statistical models were, right? But in, in the, the afterwards, or now in, in our modern age where it's possible to possibly get big data sets, um, um, we don't necessarily have to, to rely on statistical measurements of how accurate our models are. If we can just capture enough data, we can be confident that our models that we fit um, you know, the, the, the noise is going to cancel out and we're going to get pretty good fitting models, even if, if the, the, the data sources are relatively noisy that we're trying to fit our models to. So. All right, this is all stuff, I don't know, I'm kind of going off on a little bit of a tangent here. To, we didn't talk a lot about, about the, this um, in our lecture notebooks this week. Like I said, this is kind of, if you, and I would encourage you if you have a chance, like to take um, um, a course in statistical methods or experimental methods or something like that, you know, is, is kind of, you, you begin with linear regression and then you might go into some of these issues. So.
All right, uh, but yeah, let's, let's go back. Let's continue on. Uh, any questions? Let's get us uh, have so much noise here. Let's go back to 0 0.5. And I hope that you guys, um, I, I've said this before, I hope you guys aren't just reading these notebooks, but are, you know, thinking about the stuff and actually, um, you know, doing like I'm doing here, you know, trying things out, experimenting. I mean, that, that's a good way to, to actually go from, you know, uh, just uh, for, from a shallow understanding to a deeper understanding of, of the stuff that we have in these uh, lecture notebooks. Um, um, all right. So just to finish off this section here, uh, so somewhat surprisingly, maybe, um, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe not, but, but, you know, just from the name, linear regression, you might, have been led to believe that um, it um, only um, uh, can fit like a linear model. So, uh, somebody asked a question about when the midterm exam. Is, sorry, excuse me. When the midterm exam is. So yeah, it is coming up. Um, um, so we've got this week and an assignment due this week. Um, and then we got one more week, and then the week after that, at the end of the week, will be the uh, midterm um, exam. So, um, so and, and probably I only have it open for like Thursday and Friday. Okay, so um, uh, we talked a little bit about this last week. Um, so the midterm exam is probably not going to be too different from your assignments. Uh, the difference will, will be I won't. There'll probably be maybe a few more questions, uh, but they'll be kind of smaller in nature. And I won't give you as much time, although it will be take home. Um, so you'll get a, um, 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 a Jupyter notebook. Um, and I'll give you maybe just Thursday and Friday, I'm thinking to do it. So I'll open it up on Thursday and you have to, to work on it and submit it um, by like five Friday or something like that. So. Um, another question, I guess about assignment two. So the question was in part two in the first box, do you want uh, to display the, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about the, um, the, the midterm exam as well, um, you know, next week and the week after that. So the, the, the week after that, it's, um, it is all set aside for that uh, midterm exam. So we can do some re review on Monday and talk more about specifics. I, I haven't really even made it yet. So um, I'm already worried about getting behind on this course here, but um, anyway. That's the plan. Um, so in part two, um, so the question was about um, to display the cross-validation uh, in part two. Um, Uh, yeah, I can't remember. I mean, you know, I explicitly kind of told you to display the um, the learning curves um, starting in part three. It, it probably wouldn't hurt to do that on part two as well. Uh, or if it, in fact, I thought I kind of had that. Um, so, oh no, I did say that. So, so um, um, yeah, I, I did kind of want you to do that in part two as well. I think so. So if nothing else, um, you ought to display the, the, the learning curves um, using that function. Oh, uh, yeah, so the problem is, is that I guess we need to move this function up there. Um, so, so we should have had this before um, part two. Sorry about that. So, so, so yeah, you might want to just drag that up. Um, above that cell here where I talk about the cross validation of the fit here. So. Um, yeah, I can't remember why I didn't have that on there. So, so I mean, one way to do that would just be to, to plot the learning curves. Um, although I guess maybe I'm thinking about that. If we go back and look at our lecture notebooks, probably um, the, the first time that we talked about this overfitting, I probably just did it by hand instead of using this function here. So. So you can do it either way, uh, maybe. Um, um, kind of do it by hand or just plot the learning curves with this, uh, using this kind of cross validation. So. 
Um, that's probably what I meant here now that I'm thinking about it. So I was probably asking you just to call the, like the, the cross validation score function here. So, so yeah, that, that'll probably be fine here if, 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 if you want to. Although, you know, it'd probably be a good idea to also do the learning curves as well here. So, um, even on the second part, just, just to, to see that it is, um, um, that, that you see evidence of, of overfitting um, if you use this degree 20 polynomial here. Okay, uh, so yeah, anyway, back to this, so, so much surprising, at least to me, um, um, it turns out, even though the, the name is, is linear regression, that you can actually fit a nonlinear function um, using, without any changes to the, um, the model. So you can use the same cost function that we talked about last week, um, and the, the, the same kind of idea of optimization like gradient descent. Um, um, the, 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 the trick being though that instead of having multiple features, so you can, you can do, you can fit like a linear model to, to multiple features like this, or we can cr create polynomial features from our um, features that we're given for a data set and then fit our parameters to our created polynomial features, okay? So we're talking about the second case here. Um, so um, if you look at the materials for this week, um, especially the materials for the, the, the other course that I have, we also talk about fitting, you know, uh, when you have a multi-feature um, set of data and, and you want to fit like a, a linear hyperplane to the data. So. So yeah, like I said here, so if we want to fit um, a linear model, uh, or sorry, a nonlinear model, like a, a degree two polynomial, we, we've only got one feature, x1, but we can create a second feature, x2, by just taking all of our x1s. So taking all of, um, well, um, So taking all the, these values that we called, what was it, x? Uh, no, that's not it. Oh, big x, right, I okay. Oops, taking all these features in what I call big x, and tough to see the difference between those. Um, and just squaring them, right? So uh, to create a new feature, right? So, uh, I mean, we, we could do this by hand, although I, I didn't show that uh, because I, I jumped right to using a function from scikit-learn to generate these polynomial features. Um, but, um, you know, uh, so we could uh, square all of our features. So all we're doing for this polynomial features um, is something like this, right? So these are our original features. These are the squares of them. So, so these should all be the squares of the corresponding one. See, like, like this one is negative two, so that should be close to four squared, right? Um, so there's lots of ways we could do this by hand. So um, So, for example, so in this case, we've got 100 rows by one column in X. Um, so if we look at the shape, it's, or it's just a vector right now. It's just a 100 rows um, or, or 100 values in like a vector. Um, but um, so like I said, I mean, you could use like VStack or other things to, to combine these together, or I could do something like create something that has 100 rows by two columns um, and say X, um, 
the first row equals x. Or sorry, the, the first column. So, so now in this case, we're going to have two columns called column zero and column one. So I'll make column zero to be our original x features, uh, and column one to be the x squared features. Right, so um, uh, in uh, new or zeros actually takes, I think, um, a tuple. So that's why I was complaining about that. There we go. So anyway, that, yeah, so now we've got a 100 rows by two columns where the first one is our original feature and the second one is the square of the feature. Or should be. I guess that's probably not the that's probably not the most straightforward way to create that. I, I just didn't want to go back and look up the documentation for using like uh, H stack or something like that. And so there's probably a faster, better way to to create that. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean you know we can do that by hand. Um, uh, polynomial features is just a, a function from Scikit-Learn that can do that kind of a tra that that sort of creation for you, right? So um, so after this, um, so it's one of those fit transformers, but um, um, if you ask for a degree two polynomial and you give it uh, a thing with only one feature, you'll end up with something the, the same shape like I was showing. And that should actually be the same first five values as I just did here by hand. So. Um, but, you know, I mean, it would be, it would be tough to do this if I wanted to, um, do a degree 20 polynomial, right? So, so to do it by hand, it would, you'd, you'd have to write kind of a lot of code to make it general. Or you'd basically have to recreate this function, but it can do it for you. Um, um, so in this case, we shouldn't end up with something with a 20 columns where the original column was our one feature and then the other columns are the x squared and the x cubed and the x to the fourth and, and so on uh, in here. Um, but yeah, anyway, so, so, uh, just to get back here and, and yeah, we're kind of almost done with this, um, uh, or well, the polynomial regression. So uh, once you do that, like I said, somewhat surprisingly, um, I can just straightforward use um, a linear regression, right? And, and it will find, you know, um, uh, the, the best uh, set of parameters. So in this case, now we've got two parameters. Uh, we'll actually have three. So we'll have the x1 and the x2 parameter. And then we'll also have our third parameter, which represents the intercept, um, which hopefully is now a little bit clearer after you guys did the materials for last week. So why, why we've got, uh, so for a degree one polynomial, why we have two parameters, or now we've got a degree two polynomial and we've got three parameters that we're fitting um, using um, our cost function and um, using our optimization method here. So. so yeah, when we do that, these should have been, end up being the same. So this will be the intercept parameter and then those, those will be the two coefficients, or sorry, yeah, the, the intercept. These will be the two coefficients for the x1 and the x2 or the x and the x squared value. So again, this should have been like three fourths one half and then three uh, for this polynomial um, again here. This should have been exactly, this should be using exactly the same um, um, method that polyfit is using, I think. So you should get, should get end, up, end up getting exactly the same fitted parameters here. Is that true? 0.4848, maybe not. Yeah, I think so. So I'm not certain exactly, but but it's it's probably using um, uh, it's probably using it's probably not actually using optimization. It's probably using some sort of singular value decomposition, which our textbook talked a little bit about. But um, but they're both probably using the same um, optimization there. So we should get um, 
a fit here. Oh yeah, I didn't replot again. So so because it's the same, it's the same parameters. So. Um, but yeah, so since we fit that though, um, we can actually. Um, use, oh, I'm sorry, um, 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 the, the other point about this is that th this, the, that, that polynomial features um, works even if I have more than a single parameter, you know, so we only have one parameter, so like here, if, if we have, um, we've actually got two parameters here, um, which range from negative seven to seven, so, but 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 what polynomial features does is it creates all combinations. So it creates not only a squared and b squared, or, or this, in this case we're asking asking up to, to degree three. So we get not only a squared, b squared, a cubed, b cubed, but we also get a squared. Uh, we get a times b, um, a squared times b, and a times b squared. Right. And again, as, as you can imagine, you know, th this kind of explodes, it's an exponential, but if, if I have like 10 features and I ask for the, the all degree 20 polynomial combinations, you get a lot of, um, um, of, of new columns, you know, um, add in here. So, uh, the, the textbook talks a little bit about that. So that's kind of one of the drawbacks of, of trying to fit add polynomial features and, and, and fit them by hand here. So once you start doing complex stuff like this, you probably shouldn't be using a linear regression and trying to fit polynomial features by hand. You should go to, to use some deep learning, right? So, um, and uh, yeah, if you take my deep learning class after this next semester, that's kind of, kind of one of the things that we start with is this sort of idea of, of how deep learning keeps you from having to sort of do this by hand here, so. Um, all right, uh, any questions about those polynomial features? Um, and then I kind of want to maybe just go through the learning curves real quickly so we can take a break. Um, so let's just look at these, what these look like. Uh, I mean, there's a point, again, there's an important point here um, um, in relationship to your assignment three, right? So again, in this case where we're using the same, I think the same, no, I, I, I used, um, um, I used the same function, I used the same quadratic function, although I, I changed it to only go from negative one to one here for reason, for, for some of the same reasons of why we talked about you should normalize your features, um, so it, it uh, makes it a little bit cleaner for this example if we restrict our range from negative one to one, although I forgot to change my comment there. Um, but anyway, so we're using the same, and, and um, here the, the um, um, oh, I don't show the true function, but um, the, so you know though that the true function for this data is a quadratic, right? But if you fit like a, um, so yeah, we actually fit, a, 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 we really overfit. So we fit a degree 300 polynomial here. So this is what you get for overfitting, okay? If, if you overfit a function, okay? And th this is an important point here because, so, so which function, I mean, if you look at the, the um, if you look at the cost of, of this, uh, of our 300 degree function, the, the, the final cost, uh, of the fit to the data that we fit it with, you'll see that its cost is much lower than the degree two polynomial and the degree one polynomial, right? Uh, but is this really a better model of the data? I mean, it, it's not um, because it's badly overfitting the data here. So, you know, there, there's kind of a couple of points being made um, from the, our lecture notebook um, and, and our lecture video for this week here. Um, so just because you have a better cost function, um, um, if, if you're evaluating on the same data that you fit your model with or that you trained your model with, um, that's not really use, a useful thing to do, right? So, so you, uh, you can always fit a, a very 
high degree model, a very overpowered model, and 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 really reduce your the 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 cost. Um, and also, this would also work to reduce um, like your overall accuracy if you're doing a um, um, if you're doing a classification problem, right, or, or any other measure. But if you're measuring it on the data that you use to train your model with, um, that doesn't really help you. You need to know how your model does with data that you've never seen before, okay? So again, the, the, the point of this is that it does really well in reducing the cost for the regression here because it's wiggling and squirming and trying to go through as many of the points in the data that it, that it can. You know, and if, if we if we kept going higher, you know, 500, 1,000 degrees, um, it, it would be able, it'd be able to do even better, be able to overfit even more and eventually get through all these, right? But as you can imagine, um, if, I, if I generate another set of 100 data points with my same function, but, but adding some noise and ask for my degree 300 mom to predict, it's going to do really bad, like, like for a point right here. So a point right here, the true value might be, you know, 3.5 or something. But because of my polynomial fit, it's going to be predicting, you know, whatever, a really large value over here at the end, right? So the cost of, of predicting on data that you didn't train with is going to be really bad for an overfit model, is, is what the point of this figure is trying to illustrate, right? So that, that leads to, to the idea of, of learning curves um, and using cross-validation training, which we've talked a little bit about before. Um, but, um, but yeah, in particular, um, oh yeah, I might not be able to, yeah, these, some of these take quite a while to run here. So um, uh, you guys have to look at them. Um, I may not be able to rerun them here, or, or maybe we can look at them after they rerun after our break here. Um, but um, but uh, I talked, I, th I think a little bit more about this in my, um, the, the lecture video uh, about how to kind of read or interpret these, right? So um, if we plot with a linear model, you know, we'll, we'll see that there's very little separation between the training and the validation, you know, uh, so very quickly training and validation kind of come. But if, if you compare this, so we know that the linear model is a little bit underpowered because the, the, the true nature of the function is nonlinear, right? So what you'll find for an underfitting model, which is what this first one was, is that um, um, you won't get a lot of separation between the uh, training and the validation on your learning curves, but the, the, the final, we're showing the cost here, the root mean squared error cost, the final cost here is gonna be higher than what you'll get um, if we use um, um, a degree two or a higher po powered model here, right? Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, like I said, um, I'm probably gonna go ahead and, and get us to our break here because it'll take a while for these to generate. But if, if you if you plot these or if you're looking at these in your own note, notebook for the um, degree 100 polynomial, in this case, an overfit model, uh, you'll see that, that there's a lot of, there, there's a big gap usually, um, uh, not always. Um, so every time you run this, uh, there's some randomization happening here. So you might get slightly different results, but normally what you'll see is that the validation will, will not, will be the, the, the cost for the, on the validation data will be a lot higher than on the training data. Uh, maybe at some point it will come back down and, and uh, it will be about the same as validation data. Maybe it'll never reach it. Maybe you won't see the gap. Um, or maybe it'll, it'll much, you know, relatively quickly get down there and, and, and it'll be a little bit tougher to see that, that gap there. But anytime you do see a gap um, for training curves like this, learning curves like this, um, you're probably overfitting because basically, um, you know, and again, that should make sense as I discussed a bit in there, because basically, of course, you expect an overfit model to, to have a, a low cost on the data that you're trained with. So, so it's going to have a low cost on, if you evaluate on the training data, but it's going to do horrible 
on data it hasn't seen before if, it, if it's overfitting. Thus, you'll get that gap there, right? Um, and then, you know, the, the final thing, if you fit a degree two polynomial model, which, which is what the true relationship was on this data that we're using, um, you'll get, you won't, as, you won't be as likely to see evidence of overfitting. So you'll see something that looks more like our underfitting model, but the, the cost will be lower than what you get for the underfit model. So, so the cost will be down like maybe like 0.1 or 0.12 or something like that, right? So that, that, that tells you that I'm not overfitting, um, but by comparing this to an overfit model, so here when you look at an overfit model, um, uh, well, once it comes up, when we look at overfit model, you get an idea of what you can expect would be a good cost that you can achieve um, if your model is um, um, powerful enough, all right? Okay, with that, I, I kind of want to go and maybe take uh, like a quick five-minute break to maybe about 5.37 to 5.40 here. Unless anybody wants to ask a quick question here, or, or we can, um, uh, but yeah, go ahead if you have a quick question or something. Uh, but yeah, maybe we can look at these after we come back. It should be done by the time we come back here in five minutes, so. All right, let's take five minutes, um, and then I'll come back here. I'm going to pause the recording. Um, okay, uh, why don't we go ahead and start back up again here. I see, um, actually, I'm, I somehow missed a question. Somebody had asked um, before, sorry about that. Um, so there was a question about polynom is the polynomial of features function, is it for convenience? Uh, yeah, it, it's basically, you know, for convenience. You probably, I don't see any reason why you'd want to do that by hand if you know about the, the, the scikit-learn, if you want to do this kind of creating, um, um, this kind of creating uh, combinations of of, uh, the, of features, right? I, I guess the only thing I could think of is is yeah, polynomial features only gives you combinations of the the polynomial degrees. So like like we showed, it gives you x squared, x cubed, but and and you know uh, a b and a b squared. So if you suspect that you have a function that um, I don't know that, that like say has trigonometric relationships, sine, cosine, or uh, logarithmic, um, or some other kind of relationship uh, in in the governing function. I suppose then. I mean, in that case, you can't you can't use polynomial features. You'd have to do something by hand to add those in, things like that. So. Um, and there's another question about assignment uh, three. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming, that, so if you're looking at the actual R, R squared score, that's the dot score function usually, um, I think, uh, that, that should actually be a value between zero and one. So R squared is always gonna be a value between zero and one, and it's, it's really a measure of how good the fit was, one being the, a perfect fit and zero being that it doesn't, fit at all. It doesn't explain at all. So anyway, yeah, if you're getting negative, yeah, something's not right there. So uh, feel free to, to send me the code or something. But um, but yeah, you're obviously not getting the, the R squared score, but you're somehow getting something else. So um, yeah, be careful on that. So I know on that part, on part three, you you're probably need to be using pipelines um, like we demonstrated in our lecture, or well, maybe we'll be demonstrating, uh, what we demonstrated actually right here. So you'll be using um, pipelines like this. But so in order to access the, um, the fitted parameters after you fit uh, a model like this, um, You, you you need to uh, you know you need to access the the correct part of the pipeline right so so you'll actually need to um, take this polynomial regression pipeline object and access the the linear regression part and then from there you need to access the things like the coefficients and the intercept or call like the score function or something like that so. 
Uh, all right, other questions about the assignment? So my learning curve did finish off here. So this is what you'll learn. Like I said, I mean, you can, it can sometimes happen that it closes pretty quickly, uh, which is kind of a good lesson. So you can't always, you know, you, you might not always get a very clean kind of learning curve. So, so um, uh, you know, but, but here in this case, you'll usually get something that looks like this. So there's a pretty big gap, although it, it almost closes the gap. Um, after a bit, right? And again, the important thing about this, so, so comparing this to our underfit model, you know, our overfit model, at least if, if you are pretty certain that it's overfitting, you get some information. You get the information that, well, um, if I have a properly tuned model, I, I, I should be able to expect that the validation can get down to close to what I get for the, the training validation, you know, so uh, uh, below 0.1 here. If my model's pretty good, right? So, and again, for for a properly, this is our degree two model that we fit. So, so again, notice it doesn't look like it's overfitting because it pretty immediately, and 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 the the the, the validation stays around where the training is, uh, but they're both around point one, right? Uh, which we saw that we could maybe expect. Uh, I mean, you would expect um, that 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 for an overfit model that that it. Uh, that this should be below actually what you can expect to achieve a, a little bit, which is kind of what we see here, right? So I get pretty much like about 0 0.1 exactly um, for our, our model that we know is really the best model here since our function is truly a degree two polynomial, so. All right. Okay, let's, uh, let's open the other one here. Um, all right, so I don't know if I'll spend quite as much time on this one. Um, but yeah, our second lecture notebook was about regularization then. So, I mean, this is the general idea of regularization, right? So, you know, you, you have to understand the idea of the cost function that, that we introduced last week, right? So regularization, I mean, you, you can think of it as just a penalty. And, and the penalty is basically based on the size of the parameters, right? So notice that all we're doing is, um, uh, and again, like we talked about, I mean, you can take the square, we need to sum up the, the magnitude of the size of the parameters for the model that we're fitting. That's, that's what these theta are. So we could do that by like squaring them, or we could do that by taking the absolute value. And, and in this case, those are the two different types of regularization that we usually mostly talk about. Uh, these go by a couple of different names, um, but um, in a mathematical context, this is often called the L2. Uh, regularization when we're taking the square and, and when you take the absolute value that's the L1 um, regularization uh, uh, the L1 norm or the L2 norm those, those are terms from linear algebra the the, the norm and, and L1 L2 and there's other kinds of norms so um, So anyway, the, the, I mean, it, it's really just a penalty. So the, basically, all things considered, um, what happens is if these theta are all really small, then when you sum up the square or sum up the absolute value of it, that sum is going to be small. And that's going to add, not going to add very much. So it's going to keep the cost low, right? So that, that's the important thing to understand is, is that if you add up this penalty, uh, it, basically, what, what both of these are trying to do is they're trying to force you to keep the theta as, as small as possible while still also um, 
um, you know, having a good cost function. So we're still using like the mean, the root mean squared error, the, the, the mean squared error cost function or whatever our cost function is. We're just adding in this, this regularization penalty. Um, and again, that's, this is what the alpha is. That's a, um, um, a meta parameter. So that'll be something that you can specify uh, in your models. Um, and, and if you make alpha big, that means you want to uh, make the, the penalty be significant for the model you're trying to create. So that will tend to try and make these really s as small as possible, even at the cost of, of maybe having not all that great of a fit according to your cost function, right? But if you make alpha really small, or if you make alpha zero, then that goes away. So that's just like using, so when, when alpha zero in this case, that's, that's just using the regular cost function with no regularization. But if you have alpha really small, that means that I just want a, a small penalty. So, so even if the, the parameters are getting kind of large, it won't have a big effect on the overall cost when I add in that penalty, right? Um, so what you'll find is that um, adding in L1 penalty or, or the square of these or L2 penalty has a special name for linear regression. So for linear regression, if you add in the L2 norm or, or basically add in the square, that's called, um, I can never remember, but that's called um, 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 Ridge regression, sorry, yeah, ridge regression that we're talking about here. Um, and then if you add in just L1, you know, the absolute value, that's the lasso regression, that's the other one here. And elastic nets are basically just nets where you can have both L1 and L2 regression. So that's really the only difference, okay? And what you'll find is that there's no special names for these on other kinds of machine learning methods, right? So you can add in regularization, for support vector machines or trees, trees, well, for trees, it's a little bit different, but um, for other kinds of machine learning models, you can add in regularization like this, uh, but it doesn't really go by special names. It has special names because linear regression um, is, is, you know, in, in the field of statistics and academic statistics, linear regression is kind of studied um, and, and, and yeah, people came up with these special sorts of names for adding in um, L1 or L2 kinds of um, penalties for this regularization cost. So. Uh, oh, did I, I, I think I, let me check. I hope I, I turned on the, uh, turned the recording back on here. I think I did. Uh, oh, yeah, okay, good. Um, all right, so as discussed in here, the, the main difference is that L1, um, you know, so, so or sorry, L, L2 or using the square, um, the, the practical effect is it tends not to completely eliminate parameters. It just, t it, it tends to keep all the parameters, uh, but, but try and keep them small, uh, you know, or try and make them as small as possible, depending on how much alpha, how much L2 regularization you add in. So, and, and actually, usually you're more likely to want to use L2 rather than L1 because normally um, you're not doing kind of what we're doing here for our assignment three. So normally you, you don't have evidence that some of my parameters, some of my features that I'm trying to fit a model to are not needed for the model. So normally, like, like if I have 10 features, I want to use all 10 features. It's just that some features might be more important than others, but all of them might be useful in explaining or fitting a model of your data, right? So in that case, normally what you want to do is use L2 because it won't try and eliminate, or it won't have the effect of eliminating parameters. Uh, it'll just have the effect of making them uh, small when, when they're not helping a lot. Um, with, with fitting your data, right? So the re result is something like this. Um, so, so again here, we're using, in this case, we're using, um, uh, what was it? We're using all, um, we're, we're fitting models uh, that were all of degree 25, I guess, right? So these are all 20, degree 25 polynomials. Although again, we're still using the, uh, the, the actual data is, you know, the, the squared data. So the true function is still the square data that we've been, the, the square function that we've been using here, that's the dotted line. 
But, um, so if we use a degree 25 polynomial with no L2 regularization or, or no ridge uh, regression, um, so alpha is zero, that means if we had no ridge regression, uh, it overfits a bit. So we get the, you know, we get the squirmy squiggly kind of result, right? And if we use um, a little bit too much, it, it's, uh, it, again, it doesn't eliminate the parameters, so it's, it's still nonlinear, but it's pretty muchly coming back to a, a, a linear, it's, 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 it's making it more like a linear model here, um, even though it hasn't el eliminated all the nonlinear um, relationship. And if you use the right amount, and, and again, the, the, it's going to be tough to figure out what the right amount of regularization is, but here, since we kind of know what the true function is, we can kind of see that, that an alpha of one is giving us a better result than, than two, than you know, zero is too small, or none is too small, we're overfitting, but a um, hundred is too big. And it's, it's forcing it to be more linear than it really should be, um, than, than what would be an ideal fitted model here, right? And if, um, and, and here was kind of the, the, que the last question I just got. So here you gotta be careful. So if I'm doing a pipeline, I have to first get the, the, um, uh, the, the second part of the pipeline. That's the thing that's actually gonna be fit when I, when I say fit my pipeline here. That'll have the parameters. Um, and then if you pull that out of the pipeline, you can get your intercept and your coefficient. Um, and you should also get, be able to get your score. Um, um, oh yeah, th these were just the the coefficients for um, the uh, for a couple of the different ones. So the ones where the regularization was zero, I think, and this this is for where it was one. Okay. So again, remember the true values of the function is one half x squared. Um, and in this case, this is going to be the, um, the, the, the intercept, the third one, but this is going to be the x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, and so on, right? So, so this should be one half, um, and this should be, but again, notice it, it doesn't eliminate all this. So all of these have some value for the parameters, even for the, the one that was good, which was our ridge regression one. That was the kind of the orange one here. So you should be able to get the score function. Um, the, 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 the R2 score, if you call score on this, I think it's score, right? Um, oh, oh, score, you have to give it, um, to get the data again. So that should be, um, oh yeah, to do this, we're gonna have to, uh, uh, oh, well, uh, I don't know if I wanna give this away, well, I mean, you have to send your data through the polynomial features pipeline in order to get it in uh, to calculate the score on here. So, so you're going to have to um, call the first part of your of your pipeline um, to get the poly features. Um, like we were doing um, up here or down here. Um, um, right, you have to call fit transform. That was what I was trying to remember. So, um, So, so anyway, I, I guess this is good to talk about. I mean, you can always get these things uh, after you fit the things in your pipeline. You can get the individual parts of the pipeline by you know, basically this is a a, a, a dictionary, um, and then so the name that you used when we created the, the pipeline um, can be used as a key to to pull out that fitted part of the pipeline. Right. So in this case, we can do the um, fit transform on X. Um, and we should get the um, um, the um, 
um, our, our, our polynomial features uh, through there. So, I have to look up some documentation here. I have to remember that. Um, there's what I'm looking for. Um, oh, just transform. Okay. Uh, yeah, we don't want to fit it again. We just want to do the transform. So, um, yeah, so we should be able to transform again and given it our, our raw data, whatever um, we were calling it here. So, it's that big X, I think. And yeah, big X. So, that'll, that'll transform it into the degree 25 polynomial using our. Um, using our uh, poly uh, uh, polynomial features in the pipeline here. Um, and then though we can, um, because the, 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 the fit for the model here for our ridge regression is expecting a degree 25 polynomial coming in. So it has to go through the, 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 the pipeline first. So, um, so X shouldn't be just big X, it should be big X after we transform it into uh, degree 25, um, and then we want like our score of that against, uh, or R squared score of that against um, the labels, Y. So, so yeah, oh, yeah, I had to check that. I was expecting a lot higher. Um, oh, this is, um, yeah, it's my, my degree one. Is that, uh, let me check something here real quick. Oh, one one is the 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 the. I'm sorry, I have bad names here. I should go back and fix my notebook. So yeah, the one was the degree 100. So I really wanted to. If you look at the small, the the one that I called small, that should have a pretty good fit. Uh, let's do that one instead. So. There. Oh, uh, yeah. You'll probably, uh, for your assignment, you'll probably actually get even better than that. But, but, uh, but yeah, so anyway, you should get a value between zero and one um, on that there. Uh, all right, and then um, kind of, yeah, to finish this up here. So, you know, the, the lasso regression is basically doing the L1 norm. So it's just using the absolute value. Uh, the practical effect is here, th this is good if you do expect that you've got some features that are just redundant or are just linear combinations of other features and you want to try and get rid of them, eliminate them, right? So sometimes you do this, I mean, instead of relying on regression, in, in your data cleaning, you might want to check the correlation between your features. And if features are too highly correlated, you just want to drop them. So that, that's, that's one way, that's, that's probably the more normal way is, is like in the data cleaning step, you look for highly correlated features and you remove them because they're not gonna help you fit your model. But uh, another kind of similar way to do that is if you use the L1 norm, if you do have features that, that are um, um, correlated, um, then, then you might want to use L1 norm. Or in this case, we've got polynomial degrees that are overpowered uh, and they're not, they, we don't really need them uh, to fit a good model here. So, so if we use our um, lasso regression or, or L1 norm regression, um, it will actually tend to drop those. So, so the result be, so again, yeah, if we plot these, so notice 
we get an actual line this kind this time um, because it, it it as we'll see it actually dropped made zero so so if we look at um, um, again you know I had to kind of play around to find good values so so one was too big in this case instead but but one was about right for the the ridge regression so so for one though. Um, um, it basically dropped everything and just had an intercept of three. And so that's what the straight line with an intercept of three is giving us um, for um, alpha one, right? Uh, but for this one, basically we got zero for, uh, so this is the x, x squared, x cubed. Uh, it zeroed out everything except for x squared and x to the fourth, right? And again, you can compare this. So we got an intercept of three, and, and this should have been um, one half, remember. But the reason why x squared and x fourth, uh, th this is often happens, you know, because x fourth and x squared are uh, even powers of each other. So when you combine those, you're approximately getting the, um, the um, uh, what was it, like three fourths x squared um, or whatever the, the value was on that. So. But but it did drive. It basically did end up dropping. You know, even though our function was only x squared, it, 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 it did pretty good. It dropped x to the fifth and everything higher than that here. So. Uh, yeah, and then yeah, that was pretty much it for the snowbank. So elastic net. Oh, and, and, and I kind of did skip over. So I probably I probably should have shown. So um, let me just go back one more point here real quickly. So yeah, looking at the, so notice basically when, when we use the scikit-learn, the ridge regression or the lasso regression, uh, we, we specify alpha and, and that's basically the, the parameter that um, um, sets the amount of regularization to use, right? So, um, and this parameter name will be different for different machine learning methods. So it'll be called something different for support vector machines and and this is kind of where it helps to understand kind of the the the, the details of how these models work in order to better understand if you're trying to read through the documentation of the parameters for a library like scikit-learn or some other machine learning library of, of, of having an understanding of, of what these mean and, and how they're affecting things so. Um, yeah, and we were just using that alpha, the, the same parameter name for that, and also for the, the lasso, just specifying an alpha. Um, and then for ridge regression, there's a single parameter, but it controls, um, uh, I'm sorry, no, there's, there's an R, um, you can specify R and alpha. So R controls sort of a combination of using L1 and um, L2 regression. So, um, so yeah, if you want to use more, more of L1, make R bigger, right? If you make R1, uh, then, um, then, then, this, then you'll be using no L2 and all of L1. So that, that uh, so an R of one, um, is the same as using the the L1 or the um, the lasso regression, and an R of zero would would, would use none of the this L1 absolute value, and would use all of the um, L0 um, regression or sorry L, L2 um, regression here. So. But then you can also specify an alpha, um, and, and that works kind of the same except for we're making a combination of L1 and L2. All right. Um, oh, um, oh, yeah. So I guess um, in um, in scikit learn anyway, it's it's not called R. It's called L one ratio. So so you have, you still have alpha you can specify, but but yeah, you spec you specify this L one ratio. It's a better name than R, I suppose. So that's how much. Uh, so if you want exactly equal amounts of L1 and L2, you can just use 0.5 and you'll kind of do a combination of those two. So. 
Okay, yeah, we, well, we got quite a few people here. Um, um, so that, that was kind of everything I was thinking about um, for our materials this week. Uh, anybody have any questions on anything here? On the assignment? Um, okay. All right. Um, yeah, well, um, if nobody has any questions here, um, I'm probably gonna go ahead and, um, stop our session for the day. Um, as usual, I'll get this posted as soon as I can. Um, but yeah, if you think of a question after we stop, you know, feel free to email it to me uh, as you work on your assignment for this week. All right. Uh, well, I have a good day, rest of the day, um, and I will see you guys then um, at our next session then or whatever. See you guys.